Hello, everyone. We're back here at the DPLA West Coast Plenary, and it's my great pleasure to introduce very briefly those who will give perspectives on the DPLA. I'm John Palfrey, um, Chair of the Steering Committee of DPLA, and thrilled that you're all here. And thank you again to those joining by webcast. Um, there are uh, six uh, amazing people from this community here to give perspectives on the DPLA. As Doran explained earlier, we're in a planning process where we're still trying to figure out exactly what the DPLA is and how it will be built. We're making a lot of progress toward that, but um, as we go, we want to be sure that we keep a very big, broad, ambitious vision in mind. And we have six people to give perspectives on how the DPLA can change the world in great ways, uh, and I'm thrilled they've joined us. I'm going to um, uh, introduce them very briefly. You've got their bios in the packet, but mostly we want to hear from them. Uh, Christina Woolsey from Exploratorium will go first. Uh, Praveen Madan from Kepler's 2020 second. Uh, Tim O'Reilly, CEO of O'Reilly Media third. Uh, John Walton, CIO from the um, city and county of uh, San Francisco. Dwight McInvale, member of our steering committee and from the Georgetown uh, County Library in South Carolina. And last, Phoebe Ayers uh, on the end from Wikimedia Foundation and UC Davis. She gets a shout out, all right, that's cool. Um, and uh, without uh, anything further, Christina Wolsey, give us your perspective on the DPLA. I actually still remember how to talk without my slides. It shows how old I am. So I will do that while this uh, boots up. First of all, it's a delight to be here. Uh, as I was, I'm pleased that DPLA has now come to the West Coast. Uh, as I was listening today, I realized I'm a native San Franciscan. And uh, there was a moment in about 1993, 94, where I was in uh, uh, the Library of Congress in uh, Washington, DC. And it was a great event. It was in the James Madison Hall in that incredible building. I mean, this is, this is for West Coasters. This is pretty traditional, but that was very traditional. And I was on a panel, for whatever set of reasons, with Lauren Bacall and Michael Tilson Thomas. And we were, in fact, celebrating an incredible event. It was the, um, <clears throat> oh, now I need to do my posture. So we were, we were, the celebration was in fact the uh, digitizing of the Leonard Bernstein uh, collection. It was an amazing moment. The family had spent a long time deciding that in fact this would be the repository for all these amazing objects and uh, records and displays. And uh, during the course of the conversation, I was the, I was the technology person. So I was working at Apple Computer at the time. And I gave this great talk about how this was going to bring, because I, I believe, let me be, say why I'm here today. I have been devoted to public education as one of the most radical ideas um, of the world. And I have found that there's been frustrations in that quest. And I think shifting that to the informal sector, libraries and others, another core important idea, a revolutionary idea, as big to me as the notion of democracy, is in fact public libraries in terms of making knowledge accessible. So here we were at the uh, Library of Congress, and I start talking about digitizing. And these, um, to a West Coaster, these East Coast folks in the audience talking to this tiny little fruit company, computer company person, you know, I start describing digitizing, and people start standing up. How can you degrade our resources? How can you keep these from being important in our society? And I'm thinking, digitizing, it's not going to hurt anything. It's, it's going to be OK. It is a way, and they said, well, what would you ever do that for? And it went on and on and on. And I thought, oh, I'm, I don't fit out here. <laughs> this is going to be a long time before I'm able to have this conversation. But lo and behold, here we are. Uh, not only is this conversation going on the East Coast, but it's also, I mean, on the West Coast, but it's also on the East Coast. But I do think that this marriage of our incredible tradition, our amazing histories, our commitment to having everyone included, in fact, has a really wonderful opportunity. So that was a little, usually, well, we'll get the technology going. So my talk is pretty simple. I have about three or four points. I do have a, I do have a movie that's about five minutes, and when I, it's too long for this talk, I'm going to do a two-minute segment of it. But when I get to the point where I turn it off, if you want me to turn it back on, I will. And, uh, and I apologize to my fellow uh, folks here, but it's one of those um, things that's true. Uh, I decided not to edit it. So uh, I'm here to make a really, I'm trying, I have just joined the DPLA on the steering committee because I think it's really, not the steering committee, on a small track uh, and I, because I think it's a really important idea. But I also think that how you handle big ideas is really important. So I'm here 
really to try and think about what are the methods that one can use as you have a hold of a really big idea and you want to move it forward and make it um, uh, available. And my pitch today is for what I call design-driven technology. It's what I do all my, all my life. Um, I'm actually a psychologist uh, who's been in the technology business for a long time. And what I am push is big language now, but I really want this to be user-centered. I want it to be about um, how uh, people, in fact, interact with knowledge uh, and not about the resources or the technology. So uh, just to give you a little sense here. It, this also is, I'm an old timer. I have not been in this business for about 15, 20 years. I now, uh, for those of you in San Francisco in particular, I'm now heading a project to move the San Francisco Exploratorium from its current location to the piers. Uh, I'm actually the construction architecture person uh, and will open in spring of 2013 on Pier 13. So I don't know about this field much anymore. But here's some ideas that I wanted us all to think about. You know, in the world there's, uh, you know, certain practices um, and then you have techniques in terms of how you address them. So, you know, as you can see, if you make this very simple diagram, and I encourage everyone to think about this as often as you can, you sort of have the old things and the old ways. That's the status quo. You have the old things and the new ways. So that's, you know, all of these new possibilities of technology. And then you have this jump where you actually move into qualitative change, where what you thought you were doing was old things and new ways, but all of a sudden you're doing something different. And I think that that framing, you know, public libraries, we're sort of used to them. They're sort of old things and old ways. I think they're still magnificent. That's not the, the point here. So what you can do is you can, in fact, have these digital books available anywhere. I learned a huge amount about this yesterday. Brewster has already taken this one on, and this is fantastic. But the notion really is, what is that qualitative change? What is that thing that might be different that will either sneak up on you, like suburbs requiring cars that end up out in the world, when you think, oh, how do we get these suburbs? I thought this was such a great invention and also positive changes in terms of the ways in which people can read all these books. So, you know, you start to look at this and you start looking at that, that notion of what the opportunity is, and this was just me thinking about it, but there's a whole set of things that start to think, well, what if you add linkages? What if you include more images? What if you deal, you find some viable business model with the publishers? What happens if you acknowledge that being in a place is important, you know, social context beyond books, what about movies? What about new media? Blah, 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 blah. You can see it can be very distracting because all of a sudden, you know, what is the new digital public library? You know, introducing those books in digital form is a really first and important step. But what is the whole of this vision of what the, we want this moment to be like? So I've had two, uh, you, have two you have three choices to look at this. Technology-driven, just build on those technologies, do more and more and more. Market-driven, ask people what they want and give it to them, but they may not know yet what's possible. And then design-driven, this is my pitch for that one. Um, I've had two lucky opportunities in my life to deal with this question. In about 1976, I was asked how to take a map, now that we had computers, and make it better. Um, at the time, we happened to be involved here at UC Berkeley in terms of showing places um, as movies. And again, the uh, uh, history has shown itself. We then, at the MIT Media Labs in 78, built these tours of places. Um, and so you know, I spent probably 15 years trying to get people interested in such a thing. Uh, but it's delightful to me now, Google Maps, you know? Yeah, of course, we have, you can do this. Uh, this was something that changed the whole idea of what a map was into being a movie. In other words, just go through the place, see what's available. Again, there's subtleties to this that I'd love to talk about with people. but. How do you take a concept like make a better map or take a public library and change it and how do you do it so you really think bigger about it? You don't increase the font size or change the way in which the lines work. What you do is you actually fundamentally change the notion of, of the problem. The other example that I, for me personally, and this is my second and my only other contribution here to this talk, was that I was fortunate to be at Apple in 1986 when we introduced a little product called HyperCard. And the tagline on that was, is there anybody here who ever remembers any of that? Oh my goodness, fantastic. It was an incredible moment. Um, I headed a research lab here, a, a skunk works for Apple called the Multimedia Lab in an old uh, uh, um, um, garage, of course, that was uh, uh, run by Henry Dakin, who's recently uh, passed on, who did an amazing job bringing groups together. But what the question really was is that computers work by association, I'm sorry, humans work by association, you know, why don't computers? So we 
had this little tool that let us do that in 1987. And it had the beginnings of a huge number of things, content, linkages, movies, clickable images, user programming. And we showed people to this, this and it looks like some of you know about that. And we thought, how do we show the bigness of this vision? Because at the moment, our Macintosh screens were about this big and they were black and white. You know, and there wasn't such a thing called the internet that people knew about. So we, so now I'm at two minutes. So we now, I have a movie I'd like to show you. I will show you two minutes of this movie. Uh, and so this is what we put together in 1990 uh, to show this. Many of you may have seen this, but I realize it's been lost to many. So this is 1990, a vision showing what was possible in terms of uh, this, this direction. This is in the between Steve Jobs years. Huh? You have three messages. Your graduate research team in Guatemala, just checking in. Robert Jordan, a second semester junior, requesting a second extension on his term paper. And your mother reminding you about your father. Surprise birthday party next Sunday. Today, you have a faculty lunch at 12 o'clock. You need to take Kathy to the airport by 2. You have a lecture at 4.15 on deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Right. Let me see the lecture notes from last semester. No, that's not enough. I need to review more recent literature. Pull up all the new articles I haven't read yet. Journal articles only? Mm-hmm, fine. Your friend Jill Gilbert has published an article about deforestation in the Amazon and its effects on rainfall in the Sub-Sahara. It also covers drought's effect on food production in Africa and increasing imports of food. Contact Jill. I'm sorry, she's not available right now. I left a message that you had called. Okay, let's see. There's an article about five years ago, Dr. Flemson or something. He really disagreed with the direction of Jill's research. John Fleming of Uppsala University. He published in the Journal of Earth Science so of July 20th so of 2006. This off, or do you want one more yes, that's it. What? He was challenging Tell Jill's projection of the amount of carbon dioxide being okay. released to the atmosphere but, through so deforestation. I'd like to read. So you get the gist of it. The general idea is, can I have back my screen? The general idea is, is that indeed, this was a long time ago. This is a precursor to what we take for granted. Uh, this is a picture of me with my kids in 1990. This is them now. We have an entire generation. Uh, this has been more than 20 years thinking about this, and we start to see what shows. I encourage this community to really think about what is that broader scope piece. It's not a technology vision. This is a different topic I was working on. But what is that vision so that then each of us can build the pieces that put it all together? So thank you very much.